Good day. Welcome at this Avian Influenza Masterclass. My name is Daisy Royakers. I work at our R&D department of IntraCare. And today we would like to discuss with you what are the different Avian Influenza transmission routes. So how does the virus end up at your farm? Um, but most importantly also what can farmers do to prevent Avian Influenza infection on their farm? Because at the moment when we are recording this webinar, it is February 2022. And over the last few months, we have had many different outbreaks of avian influenza in many different countries. You can see that when you watch the news um, almost every day, every week, there is new news about a new outbreak in a new country. And the reason why at this moment there is also a lot of focus on avian influenza outbreaks is because we are dealing with the H5N1 avian influenza. In the next slides, we will tell you everything you need to know about what does H5N1 actually mean? How does the virus get this name? Um, but for now, I think it's important to know already a few key facts about avian influenza. Because we are talking about a disease that can cause really high mortality rates. You can see here 90 to 100 percent within 48 hours. So very severe illness in a really short time span. We are also talking about a disease that has been isolated from over 100 species of wild birds. That is something that we will also discuss next. Eh? How are these wild birds functioning as a reservoir for avian influenza? But as I said, at the moment, H5N1 is giving us many, many troubles. And you can see here that human H5N1 infections have been reported from, uh, from 16 countries over the last decades. And of those infected humans, over 50% of them died. And that is why a lot of health authorities, governments are really worried about H5N1 because there is a possible transmission to humans. It is rare, however, but it is possible. So what's in the name? When we look at the avian influenza virus, you can see over here, you can see that on the virus surface, there are two different proteins. Hemagglutinin, referred to as HA, and neuraminidase, referred to as NA. And you can also see that from HA there are 16 different types available, of NA there are 9 different types available. So this leads in total to 144 potential subtypes of avian influenza virus. But besides that, we also classify avian influenza virus as either mild or highly hazardous. And that is referred to as low pathogenic or high pathogenic. When we talk about low pathogenic avian influenza, we are talking about a virus variant that actually refers to all HA subtypes. And it's common in wild birds, occasionally can cause some illness, but not quite severe. And that is what high pathogenic refers to. So the ability of the virus to cause severe disease in either domestic poultry, but also in wild birds. And important to note is that highly pathogenic avian influenza is only the H5 and the H7 subtype of avian influenza. So we then know that when we talk about H5N1 avian influenza, we talk about highly pathogenic avian influenza. So how does it spread? As you could see in the first slide, over 100 species of wild birds have been identified as reservoirs for avian influenza. And we are then mainly talking about species from the order you see here on the left, these are the wild waterfall birds. And the ones you see here on the right, the shorebirds. And these can travel thousands of kilometers on their own and thus carry the virus with them over very long distances. And because those migratory birds, of course, they migrate all over the globe, that means there are very unpredictable and continuous risk for the um, potential infection of domestic poultry um, by avian influenza virus. So if you look at the fly maps of these wild birds, you can see it over here. You can see that there are different fly maps over the globe. And then here in the top, you can see in the, in the, in the marked red area, there are concentrated flyway overlaps. And this is very risky because then birds that fly in different fly maps and potentially carry different subtypes of the avian influenza virus, they have a common um, area where they might breed or might have a fly stop over there and they might mix and mingle with birds from other fly maps and that's how the virus types can interchange between different fly maps. If you look at the picture over here, the one here on the left, you might at first think, well, what is it? What am I looking at? It looks kind of brownish and you can see a uh, blue spot in the middle. 
This is um, Lake Chani. It's a really common breeding zone for wild birds. Therefore, also a really common breeding zone, you can say, for avian influenza viruses. And this picture is actually taken from space. So that shows how big this area is and of course also to what extent um, or the number of birds that can gather there and can potentially mix and mingle with each other. If you then look at the um, timeline on the bottom here, you can see with um, different temperatures how many days is the avian influenza virus still active. So if you look at the temperature of 37 degrees, you can see that the virus, um, you can say it survives for 24 hours. So for 24 hours it remains its infectivity. But when that temperature decreases up to here 4%, you can see that the survival time of the virus increases to 8 weeks. And this virus can survive for even longer periods when it has remained in lower temperatures. So for example when it's frozen, it can be retained for several months, maybe even years. And this is of course a really big risk factor, because those birds that migrate all over the globe, they might have a stopover here in the fall period, they might interchange, interact with some other birds, have some virus exchange, um, the virus gets frozen in the ice over there, and when the birds migrate back there in the fall time, the ice defreezes and the virus, virus becomes available again. And that is how the virus, for example, can end up a few kilometers from here for intracare. At the moment we are recording in the Netherlands, in Vechel. And maybe a pond nearby has some swans in it. And actually here you will see a video of a swan contaminated with avian influenza virus. As you can see it swims in really small circle, showing really neurotic symptoms, which can actually indicate that this is avian influenza contamination. And it's important, especially for farmers that are located near to water areas, or ponds, or, or, or any place where wild, wild waterfall birds might, uh, might stay, that, that is a really big risk factor. These pictures are taken from um, Lake Hula in Israel. Over, um, it was last December, and there were 5,000 dead cranes in the lake. So all wild birds that were infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza, and uh, all of them died. Um, and you can see, uh, even see here on the boat, the rangers going in with the boat to the lake to get all of the dead animals out of the water. And that's very important that they do that, because you don't want them to stay and infect more birds. Um, because infected birds, they can shed the virus through various ways. They can shed virus through their saliva, nasal secretions, also their feces. And when we talk about birds, we talk about, of course, uh, species that can fly all around. And they don't ret are retained by any natural borders or, or anything else, so that's a really big risk factor because they can just fly over your farm, drop some feces and then you already have the virus on the ground of your farm. And then domestic poultry can be contaminated by either direct contact, uh, contaminated surfaces, dust in the barn, um, but also by feed that is maybe stored um, in the open um, and also water, um, including drinking water. So there are many different um, yeah, different ways for how your domestic poultry can get contaminated. And how to spot then the disease in domestic uh, birds? Well, I think these pictures really clearly show the typical signs of avian influenza virus. And on the left here you can even see the blue coloration. And here on the feet you can see the point bleedings. Yeah, and I think th this, this whole picture is very clear because it shows a really swollen, swollen face gesture over there. And so if you see these clinical signs, well, you know that eh, mortality rates are occurring at a really short time span. So within 24, 48 hours, you will have seen these clinical signs, but also you have seen a lot of mortality. So what can we then do to fortify ourselves against avian influenza? How can we make sure that our birds, our domestic birds, don't get infected? Of course, one of the things you can always think about is vaccination. Um, but unfortunately for avian influenza, a really effective vaccine is still lacking. There are vaccines available, um, but those vaccines mainly cover the part of clinical signs, so they can prevent clinical signs, but they don't prevent the transmission. And that is why in a lot of countries it's not authorized to vaccinate for avian influenza. Because if you don't prevent the transmission, you get a, vi a silent virus spread. And health authorities are very concerned about that, especially with a virus that has the potential to transmit humans that have very close contact with the animals. And of course they want to prevent um, to the highest of their ability that the virus could mutate into a variant that might be easier to transmit to humans. 
Um, and thereby we get more um, of a pandemic situation of avian influenza in humans. So what leaves us then is biosecurity. And when we talk about biosecurity, we always talk about external and internal biosecurity. External being every measurement you can do to prevent infection um, going into your farm. And internal biosecurity, of course, preventing the spread within the farm. And when we look at this picture over here, you can already see a few uh, really clear risk factors, including, hey, of course, the birds here that are flying over that might drop some feces. Um, but of course, also rodents or any other um, wild birds that may be on the ground that could take the virus inside um, um, the ground of, of, your, of your farm. But also us humans, of course, we are our major risk factors because we need to properly disinfect our boots um, before we walk into the barn, wear company clothing, do everything we can to prevent us from taking the virus inside. And that is of course why when you have um, a free range system, as you see on the picture over here, that's of course a really risky um, housing system for avian influenza. Because the birds are kept eh, able to, to, um, to go out in the open and that's of course a major risk factor. That's also the reason why when we have the first case of avian influenza in many countries, all poultry needs to be kept indoors to prevent of course this direct route of transmission. So as said, hey, of course, with biosecurity, we think about vehicle disinfection, we think about boot tips. Um, but the main topic of today in biosecurity will be cleaning and disinfection of the drinking water lines and the whole inside of the barn. So all surfaces, floors, all materials, making sure everything is virus free. And we know from many other viral diseases, but also bacterial diseases, that they can be easily transmitted through the drinking water. Here you see several bacterial diseases, viral diseases, including H5 and H7, so highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, that can be transmitted through the drinking water. So then if you look at this um, schematic view of a poultry barn and its drinking water lines, of course we know that the temperature of the drinking water um, in the poultry house increases the further you go on into the house. So we already know that this is a really high risk factor for any biofilm growth, bacterial growth, because of course they, they are um, flourishing in these optimal um, environmental um, characteristics of including high water temperature. So step one is of course always to make sure that when your house is empty and you're going to disinfect the drinking water system to remove all the biofilm, because that could be a potential hiding spot for any bacteria or any virus. Um, but besides that, it's really important that you make sure that your source does not contain contaminated surface water. And if it does, that you keep disinfecting the water throughout the whole system. Because if it's contaminated source water, it can just flow through your system, it flows through your system, and by that way it can um, infect all of the poultry that is in the barn. And to be able to keep such a big system disinfected, so all the drinking water that is inside the system, but also all the, um, the surfaces of the drinking water lines disinfected, you need a really stabilized product. Because there are really long distances your product needs to cover, and it cannot react in the first meters and then lose its activity. That's why IntraHydroCare is highly stabilized with chelated silver components. And we know with IntraHydroCare that one liter can produce 200 liters of oxygen gas, so that's really the cleaning aspect of intrahydrocare and with cleaning and disinfection always make sure you emphasize how important the cleaning step is to make sure that pathogens they cannot be attached to any dirt or any biofilm that is still present there so that the system is clean and then of course your drinking water is also clean and that is what is shown in this test for example this is an independent research showing the activity of intrahydrocare on the um, disinfection of avian influenza virus. So specifically for avian influenza virus, when we put a dosage of intrahydrocare on the system, can we destruct the virus? And this test actually showed hey, that we passed the test, meaning that you have to obtain a log4, and that refers to 99.99% virus inactivation, um, showing that intrahydrocare is indeed very capable to um, destruct avian influenza virus. Besides that, hey, as you probably know, IntraHydroCare also has PT2, 3, 4 and even 5 registration, meaning that is a product that you can use either when the system is empty, but also hey, that's PT5, when the system is still operational, so for continuous use. 
Next up is how to clean the farm with the detergent, so with a foam cleaner. When we look at the general protocol of cleaning the farm, you always start with removing dirt from the barn, so manually trying to remove as much pollution as possible. And then you start with soaking and intra-foam cleaning. And after that you wash it all off with high pressure cleaning with water. And then your farm is um, ready for the final step, which is disinfection. And it's really important that you don't skip this first step of intra-foam cleaner. Because you don't want your disinfectant, your intra multidest GA, to react with any organic pollution that might still be present in the barn. Because your disinfectant should have one function, and that is the disinfection of pathogens. And your foam cleaner is there, of course, to remove all the contamination and all the hiding spots again also there of those pathogens. When we look at the intra foam cleaner, we look at a highly concentrated product, so high in the active ingredient, but also high in the supporting elements, the excipients, that give the product such a perfect foaming capacity, but also deep penetration properties, so the deep clean technology. And that is what this short movie will uh, nicely show, is that when you look at the product here on the left, you will see a standard foaming product, and you can see that quite big bubbles are sprayed onto the surface. Big bubbles means that they can go down really easily and that limits your contact time. Well, with intra foam cleaner, the smaller bubbles, they can hear better to the wall. Then also more product can be sprayed on the surface. It can go deeper into the surfaces. So thereby also cleaning inside of the surface before it is rinsed off. And that is something that will also be very highlighted here. Next, when we talk about a biocide, our intra molded SGA. Because I want to divide the topic first into the chemical composition of the product. So of course, what are the active ingredients in the product? Which concentration? Um, because that's of course the key you need to be able to disinfect a virus like avian influenza virus. Um, but also the behavior at the farm. So when we know in the laboratory that the biocide functions well, what can we say about the, um, environment of, about the conditions in the farm? Because you need only one gram of avian influenza virus to infect your entire flock. So this is why, uh, of course, we emphasize a lot on the cleaning. Because you don't want to, want to have a crack, like here on the, on the floor. Um, and that pollution is still hiding inside of that crack. The pollution contains the virus. But your cleaner and your biocide don't reach inside of the cracks. Because then it's just a perfect hiding spot for the virus. And your cleaning and disinfection protocol was not executed properly. So when we look at the active substances in intra multidest GA, we, see, uh, we know that glutaraldehyde is one of the active substances. And then we have the quaternary ammonium compounds. And you will see in this short animation actually how they work on attacking a pathogen. This is the glutaraldehyde. It crosslinks the outer membrane proteins. Those are different quaternary ammonium compounds. Here you see we have four different types of quaternary ammonium compounds. And they disrupt the outer membrane of the cell, thereby causing cell leakage and eventually the cell dies. And we know also know that viruses can be tricky to eliminate. Viruses are really small pathogens, so how well you can disinfect viruses really says something about product quality. And we know from intra multi ga that we studied many different viruses and we can eliminate them. So for example, African swine fever, even influenza, even coronavirus, huh, at the moment, unfortunately, still a very actual um, topic. Hopefully, if you watch this later, we can all say that coronavirus is um, no issue anymore. But unfortunately, at the moment, it still is. And when we look at viruses, we distinguish um, envelope viruses and naked viruses. And when you look at an envelope virus, you can see huh, that the uh, viral envelope, so the surface, um, of the virus is actually really comparable to the animation ju you just saw with the bacteria. And we look at the naked viruses, so viruses without this viral envelope. You can see that the capsid, so the virus surface, um, is actually a sort of protein shell, which is also very susceptible to the active ingredients of intra multidest GA. And these viruses, naked viruses, and then in particular small naked viruses, are the most difficult to eliminate because they are very resistant to biocides. That's why we often refer to the, um, the ECBO test we have with intra multi -dest GA. Um, this is the test you need to do in Europe to get virus registration in the veterinary industry, because it's the worst case virus to eliminate. 
And with intra multidash GA, we know that already at 0.75% concentration, we were able to inactivate this virus. But of course, not only the active ingredients are of importance, hey, as I mentioned, also the behavior of the product in the farm is really important. And when we look at the supporting elements that are included in intra multidash GA, we really worked on optimizing the surface tension. So the cracks you just saw in the, in the picture of the, of the floor in a poultry barn, hey, we need to make sure that our product can reach every surface part of, of those cracks. And then this is what, what we do in this way. We made sure that our product covers seven times more surface than regular disinfectants, and that we also have deep penetration power. So over the whole wide surface that we can reach with our um, droppels of intra multi GA, it can reach deeper into the um, surfaces and to the different materials. And the first aspect you will see in the movie over here. On the left we will have um, a competitor product, a UK disinfectant. On the right is intra multi GA. And we just, with a pipette, we drop all the same number of milliliters, so both two milliliters, 0.5% dosage, here on the paper, and then you can really clearly see a difference in how the product behaves. And the first one you can compare to when you um, are early in the morning outside and you have grass, you have water droplets on them, they really stick together, while intra multi ga really flows out. And that is important, yeah, you already saw the picture of the, uh, the crack in the floor, because we know from that that uh, poultry barns, floors, walls, they're not really even surfaces. It's not purely horizontal. And these pictures really clearly show that, because if you zoom in, you will see that this, of course, is not a flat surface at all. But many people, when they look at this, they might say, oh, that's a flat surface. The same goes for uh, a yellow post-it. If you feel a post-it, if you're sitting behind your computer while watching this, you have a post-it, just get one, feel with your fingers on the surface, and you will think, well, that's a pretty flat surface. But when you zoom in, it's actually not flat at all. And we know from viruses, they're really small pathogens. So they can easily hide into all these uneven, um, yeah, uneven surface spots over here. That is what this test will show you. You will see um, the same material, three blocks of porous material. And then on the first material, we drop all um, intra multi ga 1% concentration. And you can already see it flowing deeper into the material. So not only staying on the surface, but really being able to penetrate deeper into the surface. And we look at glutaraldehyde, as you just saw a few, few slides back. Glutaraldehyde is one of the active ingredients in intra multi ga but only glutaraldehyde does not have this deep penetration properties that intra multi ga has. So that's really the job of the excipients, the supporting elements that are in the product. When we look at another uh, competitor product over here, you will see the same thing happening as here with the glutaraldehyde. So you see that it sticks really well together on the surface, um, but it's actually not what you want here. You want it to be able to disinfect also within um, the surface, because viruses can easily hide here into the uneven distributed um, parts. Last test we would like to show you today is um, the test of residual activity. So we now know intra multi ga can have seven times more surface to cover. Over the whole wide um, surface coverage it can have deep penetration properties. And now we want to see how long does it retain its um, activity. Because you know also that there are products that may be sprayed on the surface, they dry really easily, maybe they even dry before the contact time has passed. So then you do a laboratory test showing, for example, contact time of 30 minutes. But if in practice the product is dried after 15 minutes, you don't reach your final contact time and you're not sure if the product is working well enough to, able to be able to kill off a virus sufficiently. Um, so that's what tested over here. We did um, a test where we took a metal pin. On the metal pin, we provided um, a product solution of um, intra multi ga We let it dry at 40 degrees. Then we stamped it on a TSA plate, you can see over here. We incubated that plate for 24 hours. And then you can see what you see here. So all of the green here, this is bacterial growth of Pseudomonas. And here in the middle, where we stamped with a pin, with a dried intra multi ga solution, you see it's not green, so there's no bacterial growth there. 
Um, and that's the same you see after 48 hours, 96 hours, and even 144 hours later, still here in the middle, no bacterial growth. Well, when you look at the control powder disinfectant, you can see that already at the first time point, so after 24 hours, the spot in the middle is actually not black at all. It has a lot of green, so a lot of bacterial growth already present there. And this is a really important aspect of the product because we know there's always a gap here between cleaning and disinfection and the arrival of the new birds. And in that moment or in that period, a lot of things happen. People walk in and out, materials go in and out. So there are a lot of potential um, entry points for virus particles. So we want to make sure that also over that time period, we can make sure that we protect the farm and we can still have um, disinfection capacity within the house. So in conclusion, um, especially at the moment for avian influenza with effective vaccines lacking, I think we can say that biosecurity is now more important than ever before. Um, the intra hygiene concept has been proven for avian influenza. You saw the test we did with intra care showing um, the ability to eliminate the virus. We did the same test with intra multi ga So we have the test to really show for this particular virus. We can inactivate it properly within a short contact time and with a really short or low product dosage. And cleaning and disinfection in every spot of the farm really matters. So it's not only about the tests you do in the laboratory, it's also how does the product behave in practice and can you reach all the hiding spots of the virus. I would like to thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your attention. If you have watched this uh, masterclass at home and you have any questions, don't hesitate to, um, to send your questions to info at Intracare or give us a call at Intracare. Um, or just reach out to your sales manager um, and we'll be happy to answer all of your questions you might have later. But for now, thank you for watching and we hope to see you soon.